I think we can get started. Um, so my name is Julie. I'm from ICIC. Um, I lead communications. Um, and I'm excited to introduce Bea, who will be leading this session. Bea is from the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce. And I will let her sort of introduce the session from here. Hey everyone, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm excited to be here. Thank you to the whole ICIC family and thank you, Julie, for hosting this session and this incredible national conference. I'm excited that even though we can't be in person, we are at least are connecting virtually. Um, and now that gives us an opportunity to have people from everywhere, including Maryland and Northern California um, here today. So my name is Bea Jimenez and I'm the Director of Economic Opportunity at the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce. We are the convener and voice of the Boston business community. And why this session is important to me today is because we recently launched and expanded our pay setters program. Julie shared in the chat our Boston Chamber website where you can read more about our program. I'm happy to give you a quick overview before we talk about today's think tank session dedicated to procurement. So as the convener of the Boston business community, Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce recognizes the power of a collective effort to really think about the deep issues that are affecting our society today. One of them being closing the racial wealth gap. And we are committed to a vision that helps support the idea that we can close the racial wealth gap in one generation. We want to focus on procurement Although we know that this is not enough, and there are other sections that need attention, including housing and education, we do know that when companies use their purchasing power as an equity tool, all of us can do better and will have a more inclusive and equitable economy because of that. Our Paysetters program aims to draw on this collective power by increasing the number of buyers who commit to creating systemic opportunity, by increasing their supplier diversity spend with businesses of color here in Massachusetts. We do this in a number of ways, and one of them is through an annual data collection, which we administer with Boston University, a neutral third party, which allows our corporate members to feel secure and safe in submitting their data every year showcasing their local, state, and national spending numbers. Once this data collection happens, each of our corporate members sets a goal. And the goal is to reach at least 10% over the next five years with spending with businesses of color here in Massachusetts. We don't stop there. We look at local numbers, being that we're in the city of Boston, a dynamic and thriving city with many minority-owned companies. We also look at national numbers because we understand that our companies often have a national footprint and even a global one. By making this commitment to pay setters, our business community is calling and making the urgent effort to really address systemic inequity and racism in Massachusetts. We know that our businesses of color face many, many different challenges. And given today's conversation on procurement, I really want us to think about what are the ways that we need to work together on this problem, bring more businesses, and to really make a call to action for corporate members to think about this issue and really invite a conversation that is thinking about solutions to these challenges. We know that our pay setters program is one of the many ways that we can address the racial wealth gap but we really need to think about what are the procurement practices that need to become a reality, not just here in Massachusetts, but everywhere, to make supplier diversity an easy tool to navigate and also um, something that people are honestly what? always thinking about. Uh, it's the Sherpa blanket? Yeah, what's the last one? Next doll. There you go. Awesome. You know what? Let me uh, roll the window down. There you go. If Thanks, man. Reminder, I do want to remind our attendees for today's virtual program to please mute your lines. We will be heading into a breakout session soon where we will share some questions and allow you all to be 
and do what you came here for today, which is to network with one another and to hear all of your stories. But before we do that, I do want to see where people are tuning in from. I see the chat going and I think it's great to see all of the participation. Um, we have some folks from Maryland and from Philadelphia. Let's see. We also have an eco-friendly container gardening kits. That's very cool. This is a very cool business model um, from DC. We have Tiffany. Hi, Tiffany from PNG Gillette. Um, one of our partners in Pace Setter. So thank you, Tiffany, for being here. We have Amanda from Atlanta, Georgia. Hi, Amanda. Welcome. And we have someone from Memphis, Tennessee, joining us from FedEx. Hi. So Julie, I think this is our time so we can share um, the next steps for our group. They, we, we will be going into a breakout session. Right now we have about 34 participants. So I think three rooms should suffice. What do you think? Yeah, I think three rooms would be great. And we have a Google Doc that we put together of a bunch of guiding questions for you all to use. Of course, you'll probably not be able to get through all of the questions, but we, we recommend just seeing where the conversation and discussion takes you. And then we'll reconvene so that everyone can kind of share what was discussed. So I'll drop that Google Doc into the chat right now. Um, and yes, like I said, the plan is to come back with 15 minutes left so that we can have a brief discussion. Uh, so let me set up the breakout rooms. So the guiding questions for the breakout rooms are now in the chat. Please make sure to identify someone in your group who will come back and share um, the learnings and discussion from your session. And of course, we know you won't be able to get to all of the questions in the chat, and it's really meant to just be a guiding document. Um, feel free to be creative. Feel free to share any other questions that you might have um, that might spark conversation within your group. And um, I'm ready to share. We're, we'll be interesting to hear back what you think and, and have a collective learning session together. Great. Well, thank you so much for being part of this session dedicated to procurement. I'm glad that we gave most of you time to really think about these questions. And thank you, Julie and the ICIC team for creating this guiding document with really thoughtful questions. I would love to hear back um, from some of the breakout session that happened and the conversation and hear from you. Um, if I can get maybe my first volunteer. Um, I, will, I will volunteer. Okay, go so, ahead. So um, I asked questions about federal procurement, state procurement, and also the back door. How do you get in front of a uh, contracting officers or the purchasing people? And uh, there were organizations in that room that actually specialized in helping companies win. I thought that was nice because like, you know, normally small companies like mine, we do it all by ourselves. And it's good to know there are people out there that help. It's also good to know about their fee structure as well. That was a question I asked. And they do charge fees to help you. So it'll, it'll be something I'll be pursuing um, in terms of uh, how can I work with them and vice versa. I love that. Thank you so much, William, for sharing that. And I will um, encourage folks, if you feel comfortable, to share your, your name and information in the chat. I know some folks have started to share their email address to stay connected after this session. Please feel free to use this as a networking opportunity to stay connected um, to resources. Now, one of the questions that you had in the breakout session asked about specific challenges that businesses might be facing around procurement. May I have a volunteer to share um, the discussion that happened in, within your breakout room around that question? Yeah, I, I can share a couple different things that the team um, in breakout one we're talking about. And, and it seemed like there was a, a couple of different common problems that people are facing right now, which is um, in general, the idea of making contacts with new procurement organizations and new clients yeah. in a time like this, where if you haven't already marketed to them, if you don't already know what their problems are, it, it's a really hard time to go you know, mm -hmm. put yourself out there when you don't have enough information about a company to really make it meaningful. And being able to figure, you know, make the choice of, 
which are the, the pitches that you're really going to dive into and put in all the effort and all of the work and all of the contracts behind. Yeah. And, um, and, and when do you step back and say, it's just not worth it, or I don't have a good shot of getting this one, so I'm not going to put myself out there. We also talked about the, the pace of business and, and new contacts at that point, just really, really slowing down. Like even when you've got the right contacts and you're in, the idea of going from kind of introduction through the bid, through the contract, down That's to actually right. starting the work is so much slower than what people are used to operating at that it changes the way you have to think about just running the business. Um, and then we talked a little bit too about just how do you find the right contacts and make the right connections to be able to get those things done. Like it's one thing to cold call, but how do you then get to the right person who can actually have a meeting or even do a capability review with you? So those are some of the challenges we talked about. That's great. And thank you so much, Tiffany. Tiffany and I work together um, and I know that you do incredible work at PNG Gillette. So thank you for being here. Yeah. And yeah, I would, I would venture to say that what we hear from minority owned companies is typically that, um, that from inception to the contract, that can take anywhere from eight, to nine months. Mm -hmm. And as a small business, you might not have that time or luxury to wait around for that. So you really need to um, hone in on those folks who um, understand the urgency of the moment and who are, um, again, needing that resource and connection, but it's definitely not an easy wait. Can I hear comments from anyone else on this question? What are some of the specific challenges that businesses are facing right now around procurement? Hi, this is Rhonda with IVEX. Um, I would say that the challenges that we have been facing is actually, um, we are used to getting FaceTime with customers. And I'm, I don't mean virtually, I mean, where you can personalize your visit, get to, you know, uh, get to, you know, face to face. And um, with Zoom, it's not very personal. And uh, so, you know, trying to navigate to really get the customer interested in your company is the challenges that we found through virtual marketing. We're still trying to get it together. Absolutely. It is really not the same. And I'm curious to hear, and, and maybe you can share in the chat, you know, what are some of the ways that people are networking now? It is a lot harder to make a connection um, and it might not be the same. And oftentimes that in-person contact really helps get you to that next level um, and really make a, a more personable connection. So I agree. I think that's something we're all dealing with on many fronts. Um, other questions that came up was, you know, how do you foresee these challenges changing in the next six to 12 months? Hopefully we're seeing um, more positive news around, you know, a, a COVID-19 vaccine. We're hearing um, more about the possibility of, of that happening soon. Hopefully we'll see ourselves on, at the end of this soon. I'm sure all of you are equally anxious to get out of this as I am. So I'm wondering what are some of the, what do you see as a possibility, you know, maybe, maybe not just around COVID, but even given the the urgency of this moment and folks realizing um, that perhaps supplier diversity and procurement need, need to take a new, a new way of doing business. Can I have some share back around that? Well, personally, I am very hopeful that we will see uh, more opportunity as things open up. Um, I do agree with what Rhonda say that it's not the same having opportunity to meet with people uh, face to face. It's a challenge for me. I have a product. And so um, not having a service-based business, it's always better, especially mine being a baby carrier, uh, to demonstrate that live and in person and allow people to try it on and see how comfortable the carrier is and how many ways they can carry the baby and the breastfeed and the carrier and all of that means so much. Um, to, to just demonstrate that virtually is not the same as it is when someone can touch, feel, and see the comfort. Um, and that way they can compare it to the baby carriers they already own or have owned or they've tried on makes all the difference. 
Um, one of the challenges that I'm really facing right now is that during COVID, I sold out of all of the inventory I had on every platform, uh, on, on um, every dot com. Everything sold out, which was great. However, then the question was, you know, being able to re-up in my inventory. It came, you know, my business was taking a slow, slow start. So I didn't have a lot of inventory anyway. By the time it, it sold out, then it's like the manufacturers were saying we can only do PPE. Then after that, you know, so then the earnings that I'd made go to your day-to-day -day operations. Then the manufacturer says you have to purchase a really large order. We're not doing small orders. So then it's like, okay, I don't have the funds to do this really large order. I've always done small orders. And so then it became this whole thing of, okay, I become certified during a pandemic, sell out of inventory, have to purchase a very large quantity in order to start back into business and not having the funding to do that. So then it's been a pause. I've just been on pause. So my concern was trying to see if I were to bring some funds together to purchase a large order, how can I be sure that all of this money is not sitting in inventory versus being able to move into some contracts? Again, with a baby carrier, I have not seen yet where um, hospitals and insurance companies are saying, oh, we want to invest in giving a baby carrier to moms so that they can breastfeed in. I haven't seen them say that. But again, it's, it's risky because to have no inventory, you know, you're waiting four to six weeks or more. Basically, you're waiting till January for the manufacturer to even start producing because they got to finish orders for the holiday rush. By the time I get this inventory, you're looking at mid-February. You know, so you get the inventory and then how do you ensure you can move the inventory through these large contracts because then it will be a really large order. It's on yeah. the I can get some advice. So that's been my um, dilemma as to how do I move forward now knowing I cannot do small, small runs anymore. And if I have to go big, how can I ensure I can move that through the, the outlets of Kaiser, the supplier gateway we've been talking about, um, home health. Is there any way I can make sure I get the attention of these companies now before I place the order, which is ideal. You don't want to have an order and have no way of moving it, but you don't want to get an, a, a bid. When, right. when it's, like a catch, it's like a catch 22. Uh, and, and I'm getting comments in the chat saying that they feel your pain, Angelique. So thank you for sharing that story. I appreciate that. Julie, perhaps this would be a great time just to share um, ICIC's core values and, and maybe some of the resources that the organization might have for a business owner like Angelique. Yes, uh, so in response to the COVID-19 crisis, we did launch the Small Business Resource Center, which you can find on our website. Um, but I'm happy to drop in some of the email addresses to some of our key program managers who you can reach out to and work with directly. Um, since I'm more on the marketing and communication side. But um, yeah, I think that's. Thank you so much for that. And thank you, Angelique. I think you illustrated a problem that many other um, business owners can are also asking themselves. And, uh, and what other ways has the pandemic affected um, businesses in the way that um, procurement might come in. May I get someone to share back from that? And people are sharing some great comments for you, Angelique, saying one thing that you can do is to create a video of your product and upload it when you register on the supplier diversity portal. So that sounds like a great suggestion. I'm also open to... Oh, I'm sorry, Bea. Oh, go ahead. Please feel oh, free. No, I, oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> that I think um, everybody wants to do business. <laughs> everybody wants to do business, et cetera. What I found to be most helpful, and we were talking about this on our breakout session, is to create sort of this community where you're sharing and not necessarily that you're receiving all the time, you know, in return. And then you create this, this customer intimacy, this client trust model where you're just there providing information. Like for instance, uh, the, the Angelique, I believe her name was about the baby carriers. Maybe you can give a webinar for, you know, 45 minutes or so, nothing really crazy that talks about the benefits 
of breastfeeding in a carrier or whatever the model is, right? And so you're just, you become an information portal for people who are nervous and who are looking for answers from a trusted advisor. And when you keep doing that, people start saying, you know, that Angelique, every time I hear something, she's sharing something that helped me with my struggle as a new parent or things that I'm dealing with. And it's not that you're doing it to, to have an input for content and an output for an exact cell, but you become a thought leader in the industry, develop a community that people love and just start swapping ideas, pretty much like what we're doing here. And then the sales will come from that when you can turn to someone like a Kaiser and say, this is what I've been doing in the community. This is the response. This is how I think I can benefit you when you have new moms that have babies. This is what I think uh, our platform looks like. And this is the sort of um, energy, the positive energy around this baby car seat movement. I'm sorry if I'm not saying it right. And then that is a different conversation than, hey, I want to do business and I don't want to miss the sales rush. And I need business now because I'm in a, in a pickle. So that was just what I wanted to share. And good luck to you. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. That's, that's actually a great suggestion. And I will say that one of the things that I hear from our pace that are corporate members is oftentimes um, finding that two-way relationship from um, within the business opportunity is often very helpful. Um, so maybe not only reaching out to the procurement officer when the new cycle um, opens, but instead keeping an ongoing business connection throughout the year. I know we have a five minute warning, so I do want to give space for maybe one final comment. Um, maybe just share an overall learning from your breakout session. I'm, we're happy to hold space for you. I actually have a question more than a comment. Um, so at some point somebody made the comment about the the cycle, the procurement cycle time, you know, I could take you eight months to a year, you know, to even close a deal. And I guess the, the other part of that is, you know, in my case, you know, a project might take, you know, a month or two months to finish. And a lot of procurement companies or a lot of large corporations don't want to pay you for 45 to 90 days. Is any, is anybody seeing any, I guess, op opportunities, I guess, to, for corporations to, do better around that? Or is it always going to just be the 45 to 90 days to get paid? Focus on, uh, if you focus on the federal government, um, what I found is that um, for small businesses, um, we typically get paid in two weeks. So yeah, that's one of the reasons we don't, we don't do <laughs> Yeah, we don't do commercial because that was when we first started our business. A lot of times the um, time that it took to get paid, um, we would be out of business if we had to wait that long. So we, we shifted, we pivoted to state, local, and federal government where the, min, the maximum is 30 days. And um, we take two weeks. Yeah, and Lindsay in our neck of the woods, because Lindsay's from Detroit, Michigan area as well, um, because we are so heavily um, invested with automotive and the OEMs in our area, unfortunately, their um, method is to squeeze the suppliers for as long as they can, and eventually they will pay. So if you are getting paid within 45 to 60 days, you're doing really, really well. Um, because we're sitting in the construction sector where I am, we're sitting probably at 90 to 120. So we're really floating them and it does, it trickles down in their tiers through their suppliers. So they're not going to pay for 90 to 120. You're probably not going to get it 120 to 150. So as Rhonda has suggested, um, looking at diversifying your customer base into municipalities and into the government might be a way to try to help you with your cash flow and your procurement. Um, there's one other option. It's called Now Accounts, and they actually, you pay a fee. It's almost like taking a credit card, except you're not taking a credit card from your um, from your company. And um, just look them up. It's NOW Accounts. Um, they're based here in Atlanta, and they will go ahead and fund you quickly, and then they'll collect on your on the other end so and, and just to add on to that they said they'll give you half off if you mention you're part of this ICCC group too 
And I'll add to that, that also some of the corporations who have small business contracts with the federal government, there is a clause in that that says that you want to encourage the, that you pay small businesses in 30 days. So some of the corporations that you work with may have a subcontracting plan with the federal government, which has this clause in it. So you may ask them if they have that and you can ask them whether or not you can be paid in a 30 day cycle because of that. And I'll just say one other thing. Somebody had mentioned a cycle from the time that you get the contract to the time that you deliver the product. Just wanted, to, there's another cycle, say on the corporate side. And just to understand that sometimes corporate contracts last anywhere from three to four years. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's before they even rebid it. So mm -hmm. all the efforts that you're doing to get to know the decision yeah. makers, you're talking about finding the decision makers, you got to keep that up because you may find someone in year 2020, by 2022, they're no longer in that position or in yeah. that job. So you have to keep those relationships going. It's a long cycle. So be prepared for that. And corporations, it's about three, if you catch it at the wrong time, if the contract has just been issued, you got about three more years to work on developing the contract. If you happen to catch it and it's a year out, you're kind of in a good spot. So understanding when the contract is going to come back, that's a question you want to ask about your goods yeah. and services. When are you going to be rebidding this? Then you know what to do in the meantime. That's a great suggestion. Thank you, Jewel. Tiffany, I think you wanted to jump in. Well, I, I was just going to add one comment on the, the payment term. Um, question. So as I sit here in, in one of the larger corporations um, from P&G, what I will tell you is if you've got companies with those bigger businesses, um, it's always it's always helpful to make sure you're asking a decent amount of questions, um, mm -hmm. either versus just assuming that you've, you know, these are our terms and these are what we've got. I know we specifically have, um, call it exceptions for startups and particularly small businesses um, where we will go make an exception and do something different than what our standard terms are. There's also, I know every company does it a little bit differently, but for us, we've got a, a supply chain financing program, which is pretty standard, but we've done it where anyone that's on the program for us is negotiated to get our credit rating and our credit times um, if they're doing business for us. So make sure that you dig into what some of the companies have to offer beyond just the, well, they told me 90 days and that doesn't work for me. So two things that I'm hearing right now is relationships, they mm -hmm. matter every step of the way. And if you don't ask, the answer will always be no. <laughs> so I think that's, that's a good two general rules um, to, to wrap us up. Well, thank you everyone so much. Um, we're out of time, but of course the, the conference continues. Please join another session, check out the schedule. Um, Julie, thank you so much for being our architect and, and master of ceremonies for the day. Um, and thank you to everyone who participated in today's breakout session. This is a conversation that should continue beyond this room. So please feel free to connect with each other and, and find time to continue this conversation going. Thank you so much for your time. Yes, thank you so much, Bea. Uh, and thanks to you all for the dynamic breakout room discussions. So this session is now ending. Please go on to the next session and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you everyone.